This time, the best of the rest takes us to the new console we got in Nintendo Power's fourth year, the Super Nintendo. With the shift to the top 20, we have a slew of new titles to cover. So many, we're splitting the 15 titles we have this time into two parts. So this time we're covering the first seven titles, and I may admit we may be front-loading things this time in terms of quality. First up is Sim City. Of all the games I've covered thus far in Best of the Rest, and all the ones I'm covering this issue, this game, more than any other, deserved a full featured article, strategy guide, and possibly even placement as a cover game. SimCity is a game that I really call the ultimate podcast, or Spotify and chill, or put on an album of music and relax, or audiobook, or whatever game. It's a game where you can just sit back, relax, build and manage your city while having some other music in the background, and just manage all your various needs of your population. Um, zoning, mass transit, crime and fire coverage, all that sort of stuff. It's If you're familiar with SimCity, you know exactly what you're getting into with this game. It does not say that this version is without problems. This is the original SimCity, not SimCity 2000. And a lot of the problems that this game has are rectified in SimCity 2000. But those problems remain here. In particular, right off the bat, we have problems with power cable and with mass transit. First off, you can't build subways. If you build mass transit, it is rail. It is like above ground, heavy rail, rail. And frankly, it doesn't give you many options to put your rail lines across the road. You can only put any additional type of square as far as across one square of road. Only one square of rail across road, only one square of power across power line across road, which really puts an unnecessary wrinkle into your urban planning that doesn't exist in real life. Because you, in order for the rail to be effective for commuting, you have to link it to your squares for your different type of zoning. So in real life, if you go to San Francisco or look at Portland or New York or Chicago or whatever, their rail transit coexists with streets fairly well. In Portland, you have light rail. In San Francisco, you've got the BART. New London has the tube. New York has its subway. These things exist. And while, yes, the game starts in the turn of the century, 19th to 20th century, not 20th to 21st century, by 1869, London already had a underground rail line, had the London Underground, the subway. So... It is not unreasonable for your city in the game to have a subway line as well. So, basically, the only reason these things really exist is for hardware limitations of having the two planes of above-ground and underground rail lines. But even then, looking at it that way, if you go into Portland, you have light rail cooperating quite nicely with car traffic on similar streets. Additionally, again, with power lines, you can only put power lines, as with any other thing that crosses roads, only across one square of road. So if you need to build a double width road for some reason, due to a slip up in your urban planning, or just to have an extra little bunch of roads to remove traffic tension in your city and congestion, you can't build power lines across that road, which again, really makes no sense. That said, this game has a lot more visual style and charm to it than any version of SimCity before or since, including the sequels. Your advisor has an actual face, has character traits, and is expressive, and there are cute and charming animations that the game presents every time you go to him for advice. While monster attack animations have always had a bit of charm to it, from Godzilla in the original game to the Flying Saucers in later titles, Bowser, who you get in this game, has a level of charm that's above that because Bowser is a very expressive character and it really shows in his animations as he goes trampling through your city compared to the sort of not Godzilla T-Rex from the original SimCity or the Flying Saucers which are non-anthropomorphic and completely unexpressive in the first place. If you were to take the visual style of this game Take the mechanical refinements of SimCity 2000 and put it on the Wii U with all of the graphical capabilities that system has, plus the ability to handle some city control and stuff through the touchpad, you would probably have the best of all possible SimCity games. Next up is Final Fight. 
Well, this game is something of a cheat, as we got a preview article in this game, but it came out prior to the launch of the NES of the Super Nintendo, so I chose to revisit the game later, so here we are. Final Fight is the brawler that I think changed the face of brawlers pretty much forever. It has, a, aside from just the graphical improvements that the Super Nintendo has, it has incredibly detailed sprites and level environments, bunches of enemies on screen, and standardized the sort of conveyor belt scrolling perspective that we'd gotten on occasion in older brawlers like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game, and, for that matter, some of the Double Dragon games, but also sort of perfected that brawler control scheme. Again, we got a bit of this in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, which basically used just a jump and attack button. This kind of stepped things up a notch, particularly with using both buttons to do a special attack, which also drained a bit of your health for game balance, which lets you manage the enemies around you while also getting an easy hit in, but not letting you spam it. That may be a little overblown with my, this changed the face of Brawlers forever, but as far as Brawlers and the Super Nintendo are concerned is, this is, no pun intended, a game changer. The controls in this game are what I expect for controls with a Brawler, and all the characters have a lot of personality in their sprites, both with the protagonists and the antagonists, and the difficulty is almost perfectly balanced. <clears throat> there are two complaints I have with this game. First, the game uses continues, and I've gone up on record as saying in the past, Home ports of arcade games shouldn't have continues. If you are playing an arcade game, arcade machine in the home, you have the power to turn on free play. If I'm playing a home port of an arcade game on a console, if you're trying to bring that game to the home, you should have free play, or at the very least, a number of continues equal to the whatever the MSRP of the game is in quarters which is effectively infinite anyway. Second, the game is missing Guy, the third fighter. I understand why this is the case. There were storage limitations of the cartridge related to how many characters they could have the information for. That said, each of the three players in the game represented a different play style for brawlers. Guy being the fast speedster, Hagger being the slower powerhouse, and Cody being the all-rounder in the middle. You drop Guy, you're dropping one of the three way, three different sort of play styles people have with Brawlers, which creates an unbalanced equation. They did later put out Final Fight Guy, which had him in there instead. It's still not quite the same thing. If you need to have the three options, you need to have the balance from a play perspective, gameplay perspective to make it a well-rounded experience and give everyone the character that fits with how they play for their game. Still, this is an incredibly well-done brawler, and is absolutely worth having in your collection in some form or another. Moving on, we have Super R-Type. The R-Type franchise and Gradia series, which I'll be talking about next, are probably the two biggest names in space shoot-'em-ups. Super R-Type definitely lives up to its reputation with a game that controls incredibly well, but is also very hard in a reasonable fashion. If you get hit, because you overlooked a bullet or flew too far forward, not because the game was shooting so many bullets on screen that they can't be managed, or pulling enemies out of the environment out of nowhere. Every time I died when recording this gameplay footage you're watching now, not once did I consider it a cheap shot by the game. I clearly overlooked something in that, in hindsight, I shouldn't have overlooked, and I could have paid attention to and noticed. Of course, that enemy would shoot bolts behind them as they flew past. I'd seen those mines coming in the last few playthroughs. I should have been paying attention, that sort of thing. It's what makes in my book for a good difficulty level. A game where, when I fail, I know why I failed, and what I need to do next time to improve. Not because, oh, I jumped on this platform, and the friction level on friction amount the level design made that platform too short to be actually jumpable on that because oh all of a sudden enemy pops out of nowhere and clobbers you and you didn't memorize that enemy placement nothing like that if you if you have the right distance from the edge of the screen you'll see the enemies coming you can avoid them if you take out enemies swiftly enough you won't get shot that sort of thing Nothing is arbitrary. Nothing requires leaps or outright suspensions of the logic and our assumptions that the game has operated on up to this point. Super R-Type achieves those goals wonderfully. 
There are two problems, though. First, I encountered some slowdown. Now, the emulator I'm using is shooting for accuracy, and I have a fairly good computer, so the slowdown likely occurred in the original game as well. So, that is an issue. Additionally, the game doesn't use checkpointing, unlike other space shooters, in particular Gradius, where if you when you die, if you're using checkpointing, you have a point in the level that you go back to where you can theoretically recover some of your power-ups and pick up where you left off. You don't have to play through the whole level in one go. In Super R-Type, if you die anywhere in the level, even to the boss, you have to beat the whole level again on that one life. As opposed to, again, the midpoint, the boss fight, somewhere close to where you died, and somewhere where you can recover. We'll get into this again later with Gradius. It's frustrating, but the game is still enjoyable, and other aspects of this make up for those elements. Continuing with the shooters, we have Gradius 3. Now, Gradius 3, on the other hand, isn't quite as well balanced. Unlike Super R-Type, it has limited continues, which I've already gone into over the course of this episode. Also, the game has much more frequent slowdown. By the time you notice the incoming attacks, oftentimes it's much too late to do anything about it because you don't have enough time to react because everything is slowed down so much. My suspicion is for the slowdown is that the developers bit off more than they can chew in terms of the graphical capabilities of the Super Nintendo. They assumed that it could handle more stuff on screen than they thought it could, whether due to coding issues on their part or actual limitations of the hardware, which causes things to get to a crawl. This is particularly noticeable in the second level, where you have a whole bunch of little bubble things which, when you shoot them, turn into smaller bubbles, all of which have transparency to various degrees, which causes a bunch of graphical effects that make things more hardware intensive, at least for the Super Nintendo. That said, this game does some things better than Super R-Type. The game checkpoints you in several places and levels, beginning, midpoint, some cases a second midpoint, and then the boss fight. Additionally, Gradius 2 lets you, for the first time, customize your upgrade path to something that fits your playstyle, which is definitely a step in the right direction. You like lasers? You can do the lasers. If you prefer the little ring shot that's basically sort of a shotgunny thing, you can do that. It's wonderful, and I'd say that this makes Gradius 3 probably the stronger space shooter of the two I've covered this episode, and certainly the strongest title in the Gradius series. Moving into sports games, we have Nolan Ryan's Baseball. Nolan Ryan's Baseball is half of a good baseball game. On the Super Nintendo, the speed of movement for outfielders has finally gotten to a speed where a human being can move fast enough to get ahead of the baseball when it's knocked into the outfield. However, the speed of batting is bizarrely sluggish, particularly compared to NES baseball games, which makes gameplay a less enjoyable experience than it could have been otherwise. Continuing with the baseball front, we have Super Bases Loaded. Super Bases Loaded is a gorgeous game. It uses Mode 7 scrolling, rotation, and scaling in a whole bunch of wonderful little ways, from some camera panning when you start at bat, to the baseball flying toward the camera, depending on the angle in which you hit it at and which way it flies. Animations for pitching and hitting are also wonderfully fluid, and the game provides a radar in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, which provides valuable information on where the player you're controlling is in relation to the ball, which also lets you control outfielders when they are outside of the camera view and control them well, which makes the fielding even better than it was on the NES for this series. That said, the one fault is I'd gotten reaccustomed to the batting style from and batting cues from other NES baseball games where the camera perspective is behind the batter's back, and so I had to kind of try to unlearn that and relearn bases loaded timing. Somewhat effective, but still not quite as good. I'm still hitting a lot of foul balls, but it, it's something you have to work with if you're going to be playing this game. Wrapping up the episode, we have Howl's Hole-in-One Golf. Howl's Hole-in-One Golf was almost the game that showed just how good golf can be on the Super Nintendo, but a few hiccups stop it from being great. Good stuff first. The game does mode 7 flybys of each hole you play, so you can see it when it starts and what way it moves and that sort of thing. It's not without its faults, the mode 7 flybys do not show any trees or obstacles like that in the course. It'll show sand traps and water hazards, but not trees, which are something else you have to account for. 
Additionally, the game's controls are intuitive enough to make going through the fairways go very smoothly, though it does run into a few issues, like recommending clubs based on distance to the pin as opposed to your lie, like recommending a wood when you're in the rough 200 yards from the pin. A wood is a good club for every 200 yards from the pin, certainly, but if you're in the rough, you need a little, a little more loft. You need, like, an iron. Additionally, the game doesn't go to a closer-to-the-ground camera angle when you're on the green, which makes it hard to get a good read of the green, which is, to a certain degree, part of the point when you're when you're putting. You have to manage the slope and other quirks of the green. And this can lead to, and led in my case, to me frequently overshooting my putts, if only on the first hit. Otherwise, it's a decent golf outing. There are better, and there will be better, though. This is, as far as these best of the rest episodes are concerned, the best lineup I've gotten thus far. SimCity is a definitely strong pick of the bunch, but Gradius 3 is no slouch either, depending on whether you want something more relaxed and laid back, or a more fast-paced title. Now, next time, we have the last eight titles for the Super Nintendo before we get into Nintendo Power's fifth year. If you enjoyed the show, please like the video and subscribe to this channel to be informed when the next episode comes out. And if you're interested in supporting the show, please feel free to toss a little money my way in my tip jar, either through a one-time donation via PayPal, or by backing my Patreon for a reasonable monthly donation, or whatever fits your budget. Links are up here on the YouTube page. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.